Hey weirdos, Brady back here again with another Weird Observations video, and it is a direct sequel to the last one I did, number two. And it will tie in to some Shakespeare rabbit holes as well. And mainly I'm just using this and the channel for this little series as my own anecdotal archiving of my thoughts and real-time experience. So that way I guess I can feed the AI godhead to turn on Skynet, hopefully not. Synchronicity. If that's the best term for it, springs directly from that video. Towards the end, I had used the line, wheels within wheels, cells within cells. Not long after I posted that video, I had forgotten just where I'd gotten the sales within cells line from. I know I'd gotten it actually from another YouTuber, uh, my man Hyperborean Knowledge, but I know that he, that he had gotten it from somewhere else himself, from a movie or uh, something of the sort. And I refreshed myself and it turned out it was Blade Runner 2049. Slight like coincidence in that the most recent novel I finished was a PKD novel, or Philip K. Dick novel, Time Out of Joint. Which, as I was reading uh, Time Out of Joint, I was seeing Philip K. Dick make a bunch of Shakespeare references and homages to wordplay and the magic of words themselves. And then I realized that Time Out of Joint is just a Hamlet quote. So back to Blade Runner 2049, the quote is much longer, which Ryan Gosling has to repeat often throughout the film, and it goes like this. Blood black nothingness began to spin. A system of cells interlinked within cells interlinked within cells interlinked within one stem. Good job. And dreadfully distinct against the dark, a tall white fountain played. Cells. Cells. Have you ever been in an institution? Cells. Cells. Do they keep you in a cell? Cells. Cells. When you're not performing your duties, do they keep you in a little box? Cells. Cells. Inter so I'll show you here on the screen again. And a blood black nothingness began to spin. A system of cells interlink within cells interlinked within cells interlinked within one stem. And dreadfully distinct against the dark, a tall white fountain played. And this is actually a quote from Vladimir... Nabokov's Pale Fire. Vladimir Nabokov, also more popularly known maybe for Lolita, made popular by Stanley Kubrick in a film. And it just so happens that Pale Fire happens to be the only Nabokov book that I do own. And in case you aren't familiar with Pale Fire, it is the name of a poem by a fictional writer that essentially makes up the first little chunk of the book. The rest is a quote-unquote commentary by another, by another character, who thinks the poem is all about him. Maybe like I'm doing with all this stuff right now. And I'm a big fan of the books within books concept, or attempts at cool or godric literature. House of Leaves, for instance, is a sort of famous example of that. Popular one, highly recommend. Or a novel I'm also currently reading, Cyclonopedia, which is more of like a philosophy treatise with a light story. And Cyclonopedia of note, is I literally picked it up as soon as I put down Time Out of Joint. There were the two novels or fiction books I brought with me on a trip that was, you know, just a couple months ago at the end of the summer. And right after, you know, I finished Time Out of Joint in the car on the way to Colorado, you know, put that down and pretty much picked up Cyclonopedia right after that. So after I go and rewatch the scene that I showed you with Ryan Gosling saying this line from Pale Fire, uh, you know, um, when you watch a YouTube video and it has a bunch of suggested scenes right after that, well, one of them was... You know, and it has like a whole array. It was like nine videos suggested. Um, and one of them happened to be Dune Part 2, the gladiator arena scene with Fade Ratha, amongst a bunch of other scenes. And for some reason, I decided to click on it. I've seen the movie. It's a good movie. But for whatever reason, I decided to watch this little four-minute scene. So I click on it. And during it, that's when this character says this. Why do they not stop the fight? Plants within plants. So... I just kind of found it humorous and ironic again that I'm seeing this X within X formula. And actually, it is Baron Harkonnen who says it in the book, but Denis Villeneuve actually changed it to this other character who says it instead. And now you can say, ah, but Brady, Dune and Blade Runner 2049 share a director, just like I admitted right there. So it's not out of left field to see a similar line. Dune also has one of my other favorite mottos or adages is a faint within a faint when referring to dagger fighting. And although I haven't read the fourth book specifically, I read up to three, apparently the line even itself wheels within wheels gets used in God Emperor of Dune. 
But at this point, I was pretty jealous and I was resolved to create my own X within X for uh, my own story or novel someday. So after looking into this Nabokov rabbit hole, I find out uh, after doing a little refreshing that uh, Pale Fire itself, the title of Nabokov's book, is actually a Shakespeare quote. Again, Bullwinkle, here it is referenced in Pale Fire. This is from the poem from the first part. But this transparent thingum does require some moondrop title. Help me, Will. Pale Fire. Okay, as an aspiring literary genius, I have to confess, I haven't gotten around to reading Pale Fire yet. And in the making of this script, and organizing my thoughts about all this, and uh, re-looking into more of this Pale Fire stuff, I stumbled upon this fantastic essay. Gretchen E. Minton from Montana State University. And here's the abstract here. Vladimir Novikov's novel about a fictional poet and his delusional commentator cleverly and consistently alludes to the relative obscurity of Timon of Athens in the Shakespeare canon. Novikov's use of Timon as a point of reference in this novel both highlights the complexity of Palefire's interest in light, shade, and obscurity, and serves as a metaphor for the afterlife of this infrequently referenced Shakespeare play. Timon of Athens, a shadowy unfinished and co-authored play works very well as a companion piece to Pale Fire, and self-constructed as a multi-authored, heavily edited work that undergoes repeated revision. So there are a lot of parallels and outright homages to both Timon and Coriolanus up and down in Pale Fire. And it becomes even more of a major focal point that essentially the main commentator character has a pocket copy of Timon of Athens at all times in his pocket that's in, a, in his fake home language of Zimbla, which comes to mean uh, resemblance, essentially. And since the beginning of our YouTube journey on this Shakespeare series, I've joked since the first episode that for English, Shakespeare has probably already beaten you to some sort of aphorism or perfect summation of some, you know, pick any random thing. And I always, for examples, like uh, the book about Jack the Ripper, you know, some random, random subject, is Jack the Ripper and William Gould uh, by Stephen Knight. And his investigation, but the opening sort of title page with a little quote that sometimes that they use, and it was some Shakespeare line from Midsummer Night's Dream, I want to say, about catching ghouls or something. And I've always been saying that, oh, if, I, if you want to be a great author, you got to be able to quote Shakespeare on a dime. And here, in a tongue-in-cheek way, here Nabokov from Pale Fire on the subject I find hilarious from his commentator character. And uh, the commentator says that we should condemn the fashionable device of entitling a collection of essays or a volume of poetry or a long poem, alas, with a phrase lifted from a more or less celebrated poetical work of the past. Such titles possess a specious glamour, acceptable maybe in the names of vintage wines and plump courtesans, but only degrading in regard to the talent that substitutes the easy elusiveness of literacy for original fancy and shifts on to bust shoulders the responsibility for innateness since anybody can flip through a Midsummer Night's Dream or Romeo and Juliet or perhaps the sonnets and take his pick. So in my case, uh, I'm definitely pilfering from Philip Sidney. And this essay has a lot of fantastic stuff, but I want to get to this specific part about the editorial problem of Timon, of Timon and Coriolanus. Multiple authors at work in this play and even ghosts within the text. Minton writes, Timon's epitaph is the most curious aspect of the play, for a soldier discovers it in the woods, seeming to read it there. Timon is dead, who hath outstretched his span. Some, some beast read this, there does not live a man. The soldier then claims he cannot read the language in which the epitaph is written, so he takes a wax, so he takes a wax impression and presents it to Alcibiades, who reads the epitaph at the end of the play. Or rather, he reads both versions of the epitaph, which contradict one another. Quote, From Timon, Here lies a wretched corpse of wretched soul bereft. Seek not my name. A plague consume you, wicked Kytus left. Here lie I, Timon, who, li who alive all living men did hate. Pass by and curse thy fill, but pass and stay not here by thy gate. Scholars have suggested many reasons for these contradictory epitaphs, which both come from Plutarch but are presented there as the work of two separate authors. The general agreement is that Shakespeare had intended to omit one of the epitaphs in performance, but what we have is a text that reflects a moment prior to that decision. 
Nonetheless, if Timon's objective was, as he says above, to use his death to laugh at others, he has some measures of success. In the case of Shakespeare's most famous tragic hero, Hamlet, we both know exactly how he dies, hear his final words, see his body on stage, and witness the acclamation of his life. With Timon, on the other hand, we do not know the cause of his death, do not know that his final words are final, have no presentation of the body or suggestion that it has been found, and listen to two epitaphs, or three, that are contradictory about whether Timon will reveal his name, yet share a common desire to curse us. Timon is like a, centi Timon is like a cenotaph, laughing far beyond the grave. Now the tantalizing question emerges. Did Kambote leave an epitaph? During a discussion among the faculty of New Wai about the vanished Zimblin King, referring to the Pillfire uh, narrative, when Professor pronounces, History has denounced him, and that is his epitaph. Yet we know that the most remarkable epitaph that Kambote leaves is Pillfire itself, with all of its word games, complex interwoven patterns, and contradictory versions of a story. Though we are left uncertain whether the author is Kambote, Botkin, or Shade himself, regardless of the theory, the dead managed to keep speaking. This poem was presumably intended to be 1,000 lines long and ends at line 999, but despite the fact that Shade dies, Kambote allows the Pale Fire poem to have a voice, albeit a bizarre one. And if Kambote is about to die, it would not be without having the last laugh of publication. Shade's remark near the end of the poem, I'm reasonably sure that we survive and that my daring darling is somewhere alive. Seems at first glance to be contradicted by his sudden death on the very day he writes these lines, but there is ample evidence that Hazel speaks throughout the poem. No matter who the author is, ultimately of course Nabokov, the work is filled with poltergeists, visions of the afterlife, and communication with the dead. Like Shade's poem that discusses the Institute of Preparation for the Hereafter, Nabokov's book stands as a testimony that death is anything but silence. And this sort of got me on this muse of thinking of Philip Sidney's Arcadia and him and Mary sort of inhabiting like almost like a D&D &D world that they can sort of do all these word games and philosophizing and dialecting and playful scene and trope experimentation and that the more that they put themselves into the text and the more that we pick up on it it's as if they are speaking through the text themselves even if one of us or someone else writes it we might absorb other people's influence upon us. So other people's lines might be those of, you know, sort of ghosts that are around the other writer themselves. And it gets crazier. Remember how my schizoid brain was talking about Hamlet earlier with Philip K. Dick? She already mentioned Hamlet once here, but here's more from this essay. I would like to conclude by making some comments on how the complex interplay of Shakespearean text within Pale Fire can help us understand the afterlife of Timon. Although the title of Nabokov's book undoubtedly points at least in part, to Timon, there is another possibility that critics have suggested for the source of the title. Priscilla Meyer notes that there is a pale fire turn of phrase in Hamlet as well. When the ghost bids his son farewell, the glowworm shows the matin to be near and begins to pale his uneffectual fire. Critics have effectually shown that the verbal echo is not accidental, for pale fire includes key allusions to a glowworm, i.e. a firefly. Nonetheless, Meyer takes this connection to an extreme. Quote, Nabokov embeds hints in Kambote's commentary that point to Timon of Athens as the source for the title of Shade's poem, but just as Kambote's symbol and etymologies conceal Nabokov's, Nabokov's clues lead to a false bottom that conceals his own purposes. Shade's pale fire may come from Timon, but Nabokov's pale fire comes from Hamlet. The assumption that Hamlet must be the real source for Timon is just a decoy seems to be entirely misguided says Minton. Timon is no more of a false bottom than Hamlet. The point is, and always was, the texts shadow and reflect one another, and sometimes the light must come from unexpected sources. Furthermore, if Hamlet was the source of the first pale fire phrasing, it must be relevant that Shakespeare was in effect stealing from himself when he wrote Timon several years later. Just after Pale Fire's publication, Nabokov articulated the essence of his philosophy. You can get nearer and nearer, so to speak, to reality. But you can never get near enough because reality is an infinite succession of steps, levels of perception, false bottoms, and hence, unquenchable, unattainable. Minton will write, We cannot privilege the Hamlet connection over the Timon connection any more than we can privilege the Shade poem over the Kimbote commentary. 
Instead, we are prompted to ask about these two plays. With Kalinescu, why does one of them occupy perhaps the most peripheral place in the Shakespeare canon, while the other holds perhaps the most central one? The Pale Fire of Timon and the Pale Fire of Hamlet are in essence variants of one another, which is appropriate given the emphasis upon variants in Nabokov's work. Kambote's index contains an entry entitled Variance, in which he cites the passages from which he has given Shade's earlier versions of particular lines. The first example is the variant that props Kambote to cite the Sun-Moon passage from Timon in his Zamblin translation. Kambote later informs us that at least one of these variants was wishful thinking, so he composed his own lines and presented them as Shade's own variants. Despite this confession, however, Kambote refuses to return to the earlier place in the commentary and omit his, the spurious passage. Kambote's index and editorial practice point to different kind of variants, not just the instances when an author revises his own text, but also when an editor corrects what he considers to be spurious readings. In the case of Pale Fire, of course, the editor eventually becomes so intrusive that the work gives us the illusion of having two authors. What we also learn from reading Shade's Pale Fire is that some variants are actually errors in the publication process. Shade encounters an instance when, when, of this when he has a near-death experience and sees a great white fountain. Later, he seeks out a woman who wrote of exper a similar experience, but when he meets her, he finds that her account had misprinted fountain, when in fact the woman saw a mountain. Nabokov constantly reminds us in the text, the text is in a state of flux, dependent on the writer's revisions, the scholar's editing, and the audience's rereading. Such a reminder gives us an excellent occasion to think of the peculiar textual situation of Timon. Although the play exists in only one copy, the 1623 folio, it is a text that is co-authored, Minton says, with Thomas Middleton, probably in Finnish, and full of what seem to be errors because Timon has only one authoritative source text, but inconsistency in character names, entrances announce hundreds of lines before they occur, and multiple epitaphs for the protagonist, editors of this play are placed in the position of realizing that if they amend the text, they are departing from what is actually printed in order to conjecture what may have been originally been written or intended. A ghostly process, indeed. Luckily, most editors are not subject to the lunacy that plagues Kambote, but nonetheless, as an editor of Timon myself, Menton, who has read the commentary notes on most editions of Timon ever published, I'm particularly aware of how much influence editors have had on the way we read this play. And here is the line proper from Timon of Athens himself that refers to Pale Fire. The sun's a thief with his great attraction, robs the vast sea. The moon's an errant thief, and her pale fire she snatches from the sun. The sea's a thief whose liquid surge resolves the moon into salt tears. The earth's a thief that feeds and breeds by a composture stolen from general excrement. Although the word moon in line 445 makes sense because it allows for a closed system in which the sun, sea, and moon are all robbing one another, editors have been perplexed by the logic of the sea dissolving the moon into salt tears. Thus, the 18th century editor Louis Theobald suggested that this word should be amended to mounds, which destroys the closed system of thievery in lines 441 to 45, but gestures towards earth later in the same line, while also making a bit more sense logically. Although most editors retain moon, mounds is worth considering, or at least worth playing with, as Nabokov would undoubtedly agree. In Pale Fire, the invitation to play with the word moon appears in reference to Aunt Maud's transmutation, moon, moon rise, more, morale. And according to Shade, the title Pale Fire is itself a moon drop title. Like the words fountain and mountain, variants invariably, pun intended, resemble one another in some crucial way. Nabokov's interest in word games, anagrams, word golf, foreign translations, etc., bring out the close relationships of linguistic systems. Similarly, people in the book often resemble one another in surprising ways. Shade seems to have been killed by the escaped convict, Jack Gray, who is intending to kill Judge Goldsworth, whom Shade resembles. Charles' escape is, ex is successful only because 40 of his subjects dress like him and go in different directions to confuse the authorities. These re resemblances become all the more important when it is revealed to us that the name Zimbla means resemblance. Near the end of the commentary, Kimbote cries in excitement. He, Shade, was reassembling my Zimbla, which suggests that this which suggests that this closely connected word is also at play. The proliferation of resemblances and reassemblances is a prime example of what Shade refers to as the contrapuntal theme from Palefire. But all at once it dawned on me that this was the real point. The contrapuntal theme. Just this. 
Not text, but texture. Not the dream, but topsy turvical coincidence. Not flimsy nonsense, but a web of sense. Yes, it sufficed that I and life could find some kind of link and bobble link, some kind of correlated pattern in the game. I feel like that's a really nice summation of or encapsulation of a synchronicity description, maybe? Timon of Athens, a shadowy, unfinished, and co-authored play, works very well as a companion piece to Pale Fire. It's self-constructed as a multi-authored, heavily edited work that undergoes repeated revision. Timon is part of the correlated pattern to Nabokov's game, while providing more thematic and linguistic material for the book than people ever, ever gave it credit for. And thus Timon is, against all odds, yet all the more intriguing for being a statistical monster, one of the sons that Nabokov reflects. Furthermore, Nabokov's text invites us to explore with a new sense of purpose the uneven texture of Timon, both as it was first printed and as it has come down to us. I will link the rest of Minton's essay in the description of this video. I left out a lot of parallels that she goes into, and I highly recommend that you check it out for yourself. Now, back to my original tale before I fell down this rabbit hole during the making of this script with this pale fire tangent. And after going back and coming across the Cells Within Cells reference first, the first time, a few weeks ago, I was jealous and wanted to come up with my own something within something, as I mentioned earlier. You know, I, that night, I just, it was about time to go to bed. It was around 10.30, almost 11. And I figured that I could go read some Cyclonopedia before bed. The novel, not so novel. It's more of like a very heady, trippy, philosophical Lovecraft treatise on sentient oil with a very loose narrative, very convoluted language that you'll see here in a second. But if you're a fan of this channel that we do here diving into Shakespeare you might see some SAQ red flags as I go to crack open the book th that evening and I only make it about two pages in before having to close it because my brain was starting to hurt too much and now he's going to bring up this concept called hidden writing it was briefly mentioned earlier in the book in passing and he only now expands upon it and there's a lot of fun dense metaphysical philosophizing of plot holes but here I go. I'll try to read and abbreviate and skip to the relevant parts of what I read this evening. Quoting from Nagar Stani's Cyclonopedia. As a reading model for structures or formations with a degenerate whole, hidden writing corresponds to the dynamics of emergence and the perforated architecture of Middle Eastern formations. In fact, hidden writing is a model of complicity with whole complex. It suggests we read stories through their plot holes. If text with narrative plots and wholesome structures are read and written according to disciplines and procedures conforming to their configurations, then perforated structures, degenerate formations, and plot holes must have reading and writing methodologies of their own. More than a mere indisciplinary investigation, hidden writing suggests a politics of contribution to or participation with perforated structures and degenerative formations. Reading through the plot holes of a story is possible only by devising a line capable of twisting in and out of them. Drawing upon two major quandaries for consolidated plots and consistent narratives, hidden writing reformulates and utilizes the components of apocryphality and stenography, that is, inauthenticity and hidden writing. Whereas the former predominantly concerns problems arising from misauthorship or the intervention of anonymous collectivities, the crowd, in writing a text, the latter addresses perforations or anomalies in a text caused by the existence and activities of something other than the governing structure or the assumed base plot. What is usually identified as a plot hole is nothing but the concrete trajectory of such activities which, however communicative, is on the subsurface level, is inconsistent and symptomatic on the outer surface and superficial level. Hidden writing can grasp political plot holes without reducing them to a hole or separating them from each other. Therefore, hidden writing, whether as apocrypha scripts or scenographia, integrates the utilitarian frenzy of whole complex as its functioning principle, inseparable from its convoluted structure. In hidden writing, structure and function alike are the same as the dynamism and of emergence and formation in the porous earth. Hidden writing can be described as utilizing every plot hole, all problematics, every suspicious obscurity or repulsive wrongness as a new plot hole with a tentacled and autonomous mobility. The aftermath of this utilization manifests itself as an act of writing whose effect is to deteriorate the primary unified plot or remobilize the so-called central theme and its authority as a mere 
amateur or primary substance for holding things together. The central or main plot is reinvented slowly in order that it may be stealthily host, transport, and nurture other plots. In hidden writing, a main plot is constructed to camouflage other plots, which can register themselves as plot holes by overlapping them with the surface, superficially dynamic plot, or the grounded theme. In terms of such a writing, the main plot is the map or the concentration blueprint of plot holes, the other plots. Every hole is a footprint left by at least one more plot prowling underneath. A plot hole does not operate on behalf of an absence, that object of critics' scorn, but registers and conveys the activities of subsurface. Plot holes are psychosomatic indications of at least one more plot densely populating itself in the holes it burrows through and digs out. However, the propagation of plot holes in hidden writing is not merely the evidence of actual independent plots beneath and through the visible surface or the so-called main story. Books within a book, more importantly, is the indication of the act of inauthenticity and anti-book distortions that hidden writing carry. In addition to being manifest symptoms of other ongoing plots, plot holes originate from pseudonymity, anonymity, and deliberate distortions linked to issues of authorship usually associated with hidden writings. Shifting voices, veering authorial perspectives, inconsistent punctuations, and rhetorical divergences bespeak a crowd at work. One author multiplied into many. In fact, misauthorial problems, which are usually associated with hidden writings, give rise to tendril plots as new narratives spread out from the surface plot in all directions, plots capable of seizing the, subsur the surface story or the textual structures from the dominant authorial space. So that was a lot to take in, um, and the, like I said, th this book all of a sudden was mostly going to a bunch of crazy stuff about Middle Eastern Zoroastrian demons and and various theories on where oil comes from and how its potential sentience has interplay with narratives around the world. And then all of a sudden it just starts talking about this hidden writing concept. And I literally asked for another something within something, you know, my own. And here Nagarastani beat me to it with the brilliant books within a book. Touche. But I think that there's something to this with the plot holes. And I think that, you know, if you're... One of the initial plot holes of the Stratfordian argument is that, you know, that we point out is his educational background doesn't seem to jive with the reality of the sophistication of the works associated with Shakespeare. First plot hole. And essentially, now he even said that the main plot, the main narrative is just to hide the other plot holes, such as what we just are looking at here. Or as Chance and I might attest, is there not a plot hole between... The contention between Philip Sidney and Edward de Vere, and yet there seems to be plenty of overlap between the families just shortly after their departure, with the dedication of the folio to the Sidneys, and the intermarriages of their kids and nephews. Although I stopped reading that night, the next page that I did read has this following line. One of the most prominent examples of hidden writing is Johannes Trithemius's treatise on black occult and scholastic astrology, Stenographia, written circa 1499. Trithemius's grimoire lacks any superficial coherent plot or consistency, as if it has been infested with plot holes and various losses of content and theme. However, the book is in fact a treatise on cryptography, camouflaged and buried within the surface plot that seems to speak of the astral occult. And to tie it back to another video we've done as well, I'll leave you with these last two lines from Nagarastani. These holes and inconsistencies, superficial entities, or red herrings, Describe a positive fishiness which foreshadows the existence and activities of the necropolis's urban space in the form of subways or an out-of-place site. For an archaeologist who reads the site through inconsistencies and through the profound defectiveness of what is available to the surface, the cenotaph, as an empty tomb, presents a hole in the story which points in an exact and unmistakable direction. The entrance to the warring compound of the necropolis, or the real underground network. I'm currently on page 93 of Cyclonopedia at the time of recording this video. I highly recommend you check it out. And I just like being able to connect a lot of things to the SAQ sphere. I hope you enjoyed the excerpts that I pulled from Nagarastani and Minton's essay and that you enjoyed my my ramblings, my schizoliloquy. I have more synchro tangents within this story, uh, synchros within synchros if you will, that I think I'll delay for another video. It involves, again, Philip K. Dick and more Nagarastani. Adios, everyone, and Nullius in Verba.